Well, thank you, John, for that wonderful introduction. Um, you all know what a great entrepreneur John is. Uh, I, I, when my announcement, uh, announcement that I was stepping down as president of Yale was sent out by email on the 30th of August <coughs> of last year, uh, John, within an hour, invited me to visit Seifert this year. <laughs> he wasted no time at all. And so Jane and I are just delighted to be back here. We're you know, in this year of our 45th reunion. Uh, and we're particularly honored to have the brass here today, John and Andrea Hennessy, John Etchemendi, and Gerhard Casper. One of the great pleasures of being president of one of the great universities is getting to know in a very particular way your colleagues who, who uh, have to deal with the same set of complicated problems. And I must say our, our friendships with all of these people uh, have been very meaningful to us. So we're, I'm flattered you're all here. Thank you. Um, so the topic I'm going to speak about today is, is something that ought to be quite familiar to all of you. And in fact, you may even think I don't have anything particularly new to say. And that might be right. But I think that both I, I may be able to add some facts and, and beef up your logic on, in a, to, toward an argument that I think is fundamentally important to the well-being of our universities and to the well-being of the national economy. And I think, so the reason for going over this ground with a particular twist is we need you. I think you're, you're probably convinced of all this, but we need you to know the arguments cold and to speak up and to advocate uh, for the support of, of scientific research in the nation because it is the foundation of our leadership. So let me show you um, what I'm planning to do here. Um, <clears throat> It's a very simple argument, actually. The first step is that, our, that, that improvements in the standard of living depend, first and foremost, on improvements in technology. Technology depends, ultimately, on advances in fundamental science. Basic science is itself a partial public good and would not would be undersupplied by the private market and therefore requires public funding. In 1945, at the end of the Second World War, the United States adopted a system, a unique, original system, of how to organize science nationally. And, the three, and, has, and it's based on three underlying principles I want to articulate because they're all important to preserve. The result is that since 1945, America has clearly led the world in science and in the generation of new technology. But today, there are some serious causes for concern, uh, that we might lose our leadership. And I'm going to focus in particular on two points. First, that federal support for uh, basic science in particular is both inconsistent and is eroding. And that state government support for the, our flagship state universities is also eroding in a very serious way that should cause us considerable concern, and, uh, that, that, and it has corollary consequences beyond the advance of science in terms of the affordability of higher education in our country as well. Um, so let's start with the first point. Um, uh, and, I, and let's turn to this chart. Um, so first of all, you can see from, this, from the middle column that the growth of real inflation-adjusted output uh, was rapid in the 1960s, uh, slowed down rather considerably after the OPEC oil shock and, 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 uh, and, and then rebounded somewhat in uh, the period after 1995. Now, that's non-farm business output isn't exactly GDP, but it's a, it's a, it's a decent proxy for it. Uh, and it is the basis of our measurements of labor productivity, which is itself, out, out, that is output per hour, which is itself a good, um, uh, a, a, a good measure uh, of, uh, a good proxy for per capita output. And you'll see that the pattern here is even more marked. There was, there was uh, um, uh, growth in labor productivity of above 2.5% in the 60s, declined to about 1.4%, rebounded to 2.6% after 1995. 
we can get from output per hour to output per capita by adding in the growth of the number of workers and the growth in hours worked per workers. And in fact, the workforce grew much more rapidly prior to 1995 than since, and hours per worker grew uh, rapidly, uh, 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 fairly rapidly prior to 1995 and has declined ever since. That's why the gap between these two measures is larger in the earlier periods. Now, how much did technology contribute to this growth in labor productivity and hence to per capita GDP? This table shows the results of three recent studies. Um, uh, we can divide labor productivity into its component sources. Labor productivity goes up because the amount of capital applied increases. It goes up sometimes because the composition of uh, the labor force changes. It goes up sometimes because the composition of the capital stock changes. Uh, and the residual is usually used by economists. What's left over is usually attributed to technology and uh, its improvements in technology, and rightly so, because if you define technology as the way in which labor and capital are applied to produce output, that's what's left over in that, uh, in that calculation. So what we see here is that the, 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 what's left over, the residual, multi-factor productivity, grew at about a third to a half of 1% a year prior to 1995, and rebounded to one and to, for the period range of one to one and a quarter percent in the post-1995 period. The, it's that, that latter number is essentially the long-term norm uh, for most of the 20th century, um, the, uh, even a little below it, in fact, but, uh, but uh, pretty, much, uh, pretty much consistent with our historical record. Uh, and you'll also see that the share of, um, of total growth in labor productivity was, um, was substantially increased in this, more, in this, in this technology-intensive period since 1995. And you folks in Silicon Valley know what was behind that. Uh, the, the, thing that um, the thing that drove these three studies, all two of the three studies actually tried to decompose sectorally where the growth in multi-factor productivity and labor productivity came from, and not surprisingly, it came from right here in this room. It came largely from information and communications technology, 50% uh, 50, 50 approximately of the total growth um, in labor productivity came from ICT <coughs> uh, in the post-1995 period. Okay, that was point one of the argument, that we, the technology is a major source of our growing prosperity. The second point was that improvement in technology depends ultimately upon advances in science. Now, you in Silicon Valley don't need to be convinced of that. I think probably everyone in this room could identify numerous creativity-driven scientific results in mathematics and physics and the computational sciences upon which modern information and communications technology rests. So, I don't want to go through a list of, of illustrations, but let me, let me just describe to you one example um, of, of this from Yale, because I think it helps to motivate the argument that follows. So Bill Bennett was an applied physicist who, who, who worked and taught at Yale from the early 1960s until the 1990s. Um, in the 1960s, Bill decided to study the phenomenon of coherent light. That was its name at that point. Um, and uh, he had Department of Defense funding, generous funding, to pursue whether he could actually develop the correct theory of a particular type of coherent light and build a device that would generate it. He did that. And what he did was build the first, built, he built the first argon ion gas laser. Now at the time he built this laser, there were sort of ideas that maybe lasers could be useful in military applications someday. But nobody had a very clear idea of exactly what lasers would do. I mean, they thought of them as potential weapons, but they didn't have a lot of, they had no idea they'd be used for cutting fabrics and textile mills. Um, so 35 years after Bill uh, made his discovery, he underwent a procedure to repair a detached retina using the exact laser that he had himself invented 35 years ago. Now, I think this illustration is really a perfect one for motivating the next step of the argument that basic science is largely a public good and that it requires public funding. Because what the Bennett example illustrates perfectly is that the results of curiosity-driven research usually 
often, usually in fact, cannot be anticipated at the time the research is done. Uh, Bennett explored the phenomenon of coherent light with a vague idea that the invention might be useful, but he didn't begin to imagine the thousands of uses that lasers would be put to in the, in the decades ahead. And in general, many, if not all, the results of basic scientific discoveries may not be realized in the economy for decades, and they're generally not anticipated at the time of discovery. So they are both long-term and they're unpredictable. And moreover, scientific discoveries, more often than not, are not patentable. They might be facts of nature, as the Supreme Court wisely and recently determined uh, is the case in attempts to patent naturally occurring genes or portions of a DNA chain. Um, moreover, typically, the results of curiosity-driven curiosity research can't, can't be reduced to practice, which is a requirement of patent law, that reduced to practice at the time of discovery, maybe much later. So for all these reasons, there's very little incentive for the private sector to do pure basic science that's fundamentally curiosity-driven. The results are too distant, and they're too unpredictable, and the economic returns may not be appropriable by the inventor. Uh, the, the historical exception to that has been firms whose dominance of a particular set of markets seems relatively secure, and so they do invest in longer term research. And you know, the obvious old, older day examples are IBM and AT&T and Xerox. Um, we can think of today's examples, but I won't mention any name of monopolistic firms or near monopolistic firms that are actually doing a fair amount of basic <laughs> research right here, in, right here nearby. Um, so given that, <clears throat> given that fact that, um, uh, that, that, uh, that um, base, science is basically, a, or at least in large part, a public good, public investment is required to move it forward. The proposition really follows directly from the preceding argument. If, if at the margin, most of the economic benefit of, ec of basic research can't be captured by, pri by a private firm, um, it implies that the marginal social return exceeds the marginal cost. And under those circumstances, the government needs to supply additional funding to correct the market failure. There's actually been widespread bipartisan consensus on this point since 1950. It's, that, it's not like both parties agree government should be funding basic science. They lately disagreed how, uh, about how much, but they, they agree about the basic proposition. Okay, so the next part, link in the argument is that, that we have a system of supporting science that has a particular character, and it's actually still, it still differs from most other countries in the world, although in recent years, especially in Asia, countries are moving more toward our model. So in 1945, uh, Vannevar Bush, who had been dean of the engineering at MIT and was the science advisor to Presidents Roosevelt and Truman, um, was the principal author of a famous document called Science, the Endless Frontier. Um, and that report, while somewhat lengthy and verbose, I think can be reduced to three basic ideas. Um, first, that government should be the primary funder of basic science. And in fact, today, government funds 57% of basic science, industry 21%, universities self-fund about 11%, and philanthropy funds about 11%. Um, the, principle, the second proposition is that the principal locus of scientific research should be universities, not government labs, and not freestanding research institutes. And if you think of other countries in the world, there's a lot of basic science that takes place in those alternative types of organizations. Now, the, the rationale is that this allows the next generation of research scientists, as well as the future science and technology workforce, to be trained in an environment where, where frontier research is being done using state-of-the-art equipment. So even if those students don't go on to be basic, you know, to be fundamental scientists working in universities, they go off into industry really much better trained than in a European system where older equipment and second-rate people are teaching in the universities and the first-rate people are all off in freestanding research institutes. So that's been uh, a major advantage for us. And then finally, the third principle is that 
while the government can allocate at the macro level between fields of science, you know, the NIH gets so much for health and the NSF gets so much for chemistry and so much for biology and so much for physics that's in the federal budget, within each agency and at each field, the money should principally be allocated by panels of independent scientific experts. So we use the peer review system. Now this system has worked very well over time, especially when compared to other countries. Um, in Japan, most research is funded on what, in what you could basically be understood best as a seniority system. Older people get more. Um, in, your, in, in, uh, in Britain, they have a very intensive peer review system, but the bulk of the money goes not to individual investors, uh, inv investigators or, re or particular research teams, but rather to whole departmental units, um, which kind of shaves the peaks. And, and the great advantage of our typically individual or, or project-based research funding is it, it leads to a very competitive market in getting research funding, and, and excellence tends to prevail. Now, there are some signs of stress in this system lately, and I'll come back to that when I talk about the current uh, problems uh, that we're confronting. Okay, <clears throat> so we get next to the fifth of the six propositions, and that is that America, the system's actually worked, that America has led the world in science and technology uh, since 1945. Um, I, I, I had to use the Nobel Prize website, but also uh, Wikipedia to actually get these numbers and hand count a lot of it. Uh, but but um, if you look at just Nobel laureates in science, the three science prizes, I, excuse me, co fellow economists, I'm not counting economics here. <laughs> only, only chemistry, physics, medicine, and not economics, peace, and literature. Um, not that I don't think ec good economic thinking doesn't contribute to our productivity, of course it does. Um, but as you'll see, with, the 1940 was a dramatic sea change prior to 1945, and even in the last couple of decades before 1945, the percentage of prizes going to America were much, much lower than they've been since. They've averaged 55% of the total science prizes ever since then. Um, uh, and, no, and it's just worth noting, for something I want to talk about later, just how, how remarkable the percentage of foreign-born uh, uh, winners of the prize have been. And these are people who are all are American citizens by the time they win. Um, uh, the other thing to say is this is not, we're not declining. If anything, the trend since, you know, in recent years is up, not down, in terms of the percentage of prizes won by people working in America. Now, okay, you can say, you're right to say, Nobel Prizes are a lagging indicator. They, they refer to research that's basically done on average about 20 years ago. Um, and that's fair. Uh, but, but there are contemporary measures such as scientific publications, and while there are just lots more players in the game, we still are doing pretty well. Our share of worldwide scientific publications has declined from a little under a third to a little over a quarter in the last decade. But if you look only at the top 1% of publications ranked by citations, we have well over half worldwide. And that's pretty impressive, and that's current. The best science is done here in the United States, you guys, I mean, people at Stanford know that. People at Yale know that. And this is where the best scientists want to be. If you look at data from the National Science Foundation, the latest published survey of 2009, 77% of foreign recipients of science and engineering doctorates said they had plans to stay in the United States after completion of their degrees. That's up from 72% a decade earlier. The only country moving slightly in the opposite direction is China where the improvements in the Chinese uh, work environment for scientists has obviously been considerable. But even there, they were started at a much higher level. So 10 years ago, or like 1999, 91% of Chinese wanted to stay here. And today, it's 89%. Um, <laughs> so um, as you all know, we continue to shoot ourselves in the foot by limiting the numbers of science and engineering graduates who are allowed to stay here. Uh, and become permanent residents or citizens. The push to staple a green card to the science and engineering advanced degree is obviously a common cause of people in this room, people in universities, and people in the technology industries. It's, it's such a no-brainer, and I just hope that in, the, in this current round of discussions of immigration, we can, we can make it happen. Um, <clears throat> 
One other myth, I just, while I was playing with the data, I discovered something that I didn't, even, I didn't know, but maybe most people knew. I thought the popular mythology was that with all the foreign students in science and engineering, that the numbers of Americans getting advanced degrees in both science and engineering was declining. No way. It's actually growing and growing at a rate much faster than the, than the labor force itself. So we, 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 our, our programs are expanding overall, and the share of foreign students is expanding. But there are more American scientists and engineers being trained today than there were 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, and a larger fraction of, of, the, uh, of the workforce receiving master's or doctoral degrees. Um, now, that's, that's so much for That's about science and training. You know better than I that we continue to lead in technology. Um, these things are hard to measure, but if you think of leading edge firms in so many different areas of technology in America is doing well. Um, we don't always capture the benefit of being first, and that has to do more with regulatory distortions and taxes and other factors that I don't want to deal with particularly uh, in this talk. Um, but if you do look at sort of the crudest measures, we, our, our share of worldwide patents has been stable for, fifth, for 30 years. It's about 20% about about of all patents granted in the world are granted to U.S. applicants. That's at any, in all countries. Um, and patent quality is, me is measured by royalty dollars per patent or citations of patents in other patents remains the highest among major world economies. 50% of worldwide licensing revenues that is contaminated by copyright, which is a little different matter, but 50% of worldwide licensing revenues flows to the United States. Again, a number that's been more or less steady for decades. So this is a generally bright picture. But now why, why, why is Don Hennessy's hair gray and Gerhardt's hair gray? And my hair is sort of gray too now. Um, the, um, here's this part of the story. If you look at the first column over the last 50 years, um, funding for R&D is a percentage of GDP, public funding for R&D is a percentage of GDP, has eroded very dramatically. Um, now, it's, the gap has been partly made up by private funding because the private sector um, in 1963 fund just a little more than 1% of GDP, a little, little more than 1% of GDP on R&D and now spends just a little less than 2%. So very considerable picking up of the slack at the downstream end of the R&D process, applied research and development. You might look, the first blush reaction to this last column here might be that, well, it looks like basic research is held up OK. Um, uh, you know, it started the period at you know, 23 basis points of GDP, and it ended at 25 basis points of GDP. But the, but the sawtooth pattern of the last 20 years is a real problem. And I want, to, I want to talk about that. We went through a period of doubling the NIH budget from 1998 to 2003, five-year doubling of uh, annual growth rate of 15%. But since 2003, real inflation-adjusted funding for health research for, through the, NSF, the NIH has declined 14% in real terms. The, the, the pie is actually smaller, not just smaller as a percentage of GDP. Um, and there was legislation in 2007 uh, which flowed out of, um, uh, out of a National Academy, another National Academy study that I and a number of people here were involved in, uh, the Gathering Storm Report. That legislation uh, authorized, a dozen, uh, authorized a doubling of the, ba of the basic research budgets in NSF, DOE, and DOD. But th even though the authorization came through, the funding didn't. The appropriations did not follow. And so the result is a pretty dramatic decline in overall support for basic R&D in the last decade. Um, uh, essentially no real growth in the, in the aggregation of all basic R&D, uh, and consequently a 5%, you know, with decline um, in the share of GDP. Now, this has created acute problems in the bio, biological and biomedical sciences where the substantial real growth, the substantial decline in real growth over the last 10 years followed this boom period where PhD production expanded dramatically um, 
and, and you know, the pipeline got filled, pre programs grew, and by the time people finished, funds, funds were, were, uh, were disappearing. Um, so that's led to uh, unprecedentedly low success, success rates in grant applications, down below 10%. Um, this, this has the, then here's where I come back to the peer review process. This leads to distortions in the peer review process because it leads to um, when there's so many applicants for so, f for so few dollars, it, it leads essentially to a very conservative bias. Panels like to go with proposals that seem the most complete and the most thorough. Well, what does that mean? That means people use their dollars on their last grant to write, their, their, to write the proposal for the next grant. And so it, 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 it raises the transition probability from grant to grant, and the winners are the incumbents. Um, and this is reflected in the fact that the average age of a first-time grantee in the NIH has grown from 36 to 42 year old, for two years old over the last couple of decades. Um, that's, that's obviously uh, a big concern. Um, now, boom and bust cycles uh, are actually not a good thing. Let me show you this one. Here, there, there's, there's a horizontal axis came out a little funny, but, the, but, the, um, uh, but basically this is the last 30 years, the five-year average growth rate uh, in both NIH and NSF funding. And you, you, you see what I, what I was pointing out, that the, uh, you have a big, big, big run-up in 98 to 03 and a huge decline thereafter. Uh, uh, even in the NSF as well as the NIH. Um, these are not a good thing because the, the, bo you know, the, the boom in PhD production and then the bust you know, efficiently utilize those people. Um, it's, it's, it's problematic. Um, now there aren't really great data, there aren't really uh, usable data on basic research funding globally. But if you look at total R&D, basic research, applied research and development, the U.S. share of global R&D declined from 38% in 1999 to 31% in 2009. China's share is up from 4 to 12% over the same period. And these data suggest that while our share of scientific output has been maintained, that's what I talked about earlier, our share of inputs to the creation of scientific results is, is diminishing. And you know, that does not bode well for the future. Um, one source of erosion of support for R&D is evident in this slide. This is the pattern of federal expenditures over the last 50 years. And you see that entitlements have basically soaked up everything. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the growth in entitlements, and the growth in enti that's a, entitlements is social security plus in, uh, income security, you know, unemployment, plus um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid. The growth, the, by far the biggest growth, uh, and our social security expert will correct me if I'm wrong, by far the biggest growth is, uh, is a share of federal expenditure has been in the healthcare uh, component. And, and so um, what that's done is not only, not only been funded by a decline in defense spending, it's, it's very seriously eroded the share of the federal budget going to R&D from 10 and a half to three and a half percent over a 50-year uh, period. And of course, it's encroached, as we know, on discretionary expenditure in general. Uh, the story isn't much better when you look at transportation or urban development or, or um, other kinds of infrastructure investment, um, uh, support for education, and so forth, all declining as a share of federal expenditure uh, secularly. OK, so. Um, make a somewhat more indirect argument about state uh, support. Now here, I would say the health of the research university is also being threatened because of the failure of state governments to maintain support for their, uh, their university systems. Um, they, state universities account for 60% of the degrees granted in the United States and 68% of the federally funded research. The threat at the state level isn't so much cutbacks in research support from states. That's just a small share. It's just 4% of total um, uh, research funding. The threat comes from a, a, the dramatic reductions in general appropriations to the, to the state universities, which, have, which generally provide internal funds for faculty support, uh, 
They also provide the possibility of maintaining low tuition levels and to provide financial aid for students unable to pay the full tuition. So here's what's happened in the states. And again, it's the same story. This is only over 25 years is the best data I could find. But again, Medicaid, which is partly is cost sharing between state and federal governments, Medicaid is, has soaked up all the discretionary categories. Uh, high, higher education has declined. K through 12 education has declined. Transportation has declined. I could, you could add to the list, actually, income support programs have declined by three and a half percentage points. Um, to all, of, all of which is essentially funded the, the, the rising health care costs at the state level. Um, uh, the movement in these numbers has been particularly acute in, since the recession began. In, and this is a shocking number. In constant dollars, over the last four years, or over the four years from 08 to 2012, over four years, state subvention to public universities declined by 27% in real terms. It's a really serious uh, hit. Now, what, what has it done? Here's a comparison between tuition, tuition growth and net price growth, net price being tuition minus financial aid uh, to, to the average student. Uh, and you see what's happened uh, at pu private versus public institutions. Um, at the, the sticker price, the first block of numbers on the, the first uh, two rows, the published tuition and fees, have over 30 years grown faster at public institutions than at private institutions, but that trend is really driven by what's happened in the last 10 years, where the public institutions have seen a, a rate of growth and real uh, sticker price that's more than double that of the private institutions. But, the, but, the, but it's a double whammy when the state funding gets cut back because it not only, allows, not only requires the state institutions to raise the sticker price, they also have to lower the amount of money available for financial aid. And here is where the rubber really hits the road. In the last 10 years, Private institutions have actually maintained a constant uh, net price. I mean, financial aid has is, is actually offset the growth in tuition. Um, but public institutions have seen a 6.7% um, growth in the net tuition. And actually, that's consistent with what I said recently. Since the crash, actually, that rate is, is in double digits. So um, you know, this is. Uh, this is kind of troubling stuff. Um, so what do we do about it? Um, it, it the, the, more money is the obvious answer. Uh, but I think mastering these arguments and being able to uh, advocate for a few things will be important. If, if, we, if we could design the ideal system, we would get rid of the, of the, uh, of the tremendous fluctuations. At the, this is a long-term investment. All R&D is a long-term investment. And to the extent we could convince Congress and the uh, executive branch that basic science, at least, I mean, applied projects, you could have, you could heat them up and cool them down. But basic science, at least, ought to be funded at the rate, it ought to grow at the rate of GDP growth, the trend rate of GDP growth. So that, you know, you pick a number, if it's 3.5%, um, just grow R&D on average by 3.5% a year. Don't fluctuate. Don't deviate much from that. And that would be the optimal funding environment for supporting science. Now, there are ways, second point, we could make research more efficient. And one is, particularly in this constrained era, I think we could move away a bit, reduce the weight. And we had a PCAST report uh, recently recommended this. Reduce the weight a little bit to individual investigator project grants, the pro, you know, grants for particular research projects, and put more money on the longer term career awards, which are made by the major funding agencies, but there's a, they're a small fraction of the dollars. And that might be a better way uh, to, to, to allow um, the really creative people, and especially the younger people in our system, to flourish. Um, a second idea for research efficiency would be to resist the temptation to tilt public expenditure too far in the direction of what used to be called applied research, is now called translational research. Um, I say this in full recognition that we need translational research. We need it especially in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, but, and, but even you I, I, IT people talk about the valley of death 
Actually, it's a good thing there's a valley of death. It weeds out the bad projects. But, the, but, the, um, but there is a problem. But that's better, I think, better, better dealt with by, by removing distortions in the private sector and incentivizing the private sector rather than try to you know, fund it through university research. I have a pet idea that I've advanced for 30 years in things I've written. And that is if you really want to push applied technologies, we have proven the best way to do that. And it has nothing to do with funding the research per se. It's, it's create the market. The, 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 the most effective innovations that we've had, especially in your local industry, have come from the government being the procurer at a time when the cost of providing the product is still very high before we've gone down the learning curve. Semiconductor technology is a perfect example where the government was paying, you know, Enorm, you know, enormous amounts of money for early semiconductors in the 60s through the space and military programs. But you could tell the same story about the development of the internet you, you could, and, and lots of other uh, communications devices where new technology gets introduced at very high prices, making it possible for those same companies to, to, and imitators to sort of um, commercialize and, and, uh, and, 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 and have the technologies penetrate. Okay. Another solution, this is a little idiosyncratic, but I think to build political support for science and frankly to, improve, to increase the science and technology workforce or attract a, a, a broader share of our more entrepreneurial students in this direction, I think we ought to really push citizen science. You know, these projects where people do stuff on their own, I mean, there are, there are citizen science groups that are aimed at K through 12 students that crowdsource, you know, watching creeks rise and fall, spotting sharks, uh, hummingbirds, all of that. There are hundreds and hundreds of these if you go on the Citizen Science website. To me, the most exciting one, and because Yale's had a big role in it, is the hunt for exoplanets. I mean, I think this is a phenomenal idea. We should have competition amongst uh, high school classes across the country to see which class can find the largest number of previously unidentified exoplanets. Anybody can do this. It doesn't take, it doesn't take much. They have fantastic sky maps on the internet at planethunter.org, and they teach you the technology for finding your own planets. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's fantastic. It would, be, it would really be a great thing to build, uh, to build citizen support for science. And then finally, of course, the big bottom line is the obvious one. We have to solve the healthcare problem. That's really, is really no, uh, that's really no better answer to how to benefit, how to make possible this country making the infrastructure investments, including R&D, that it needs to make to be successful in the long run. So that's number one. It would help, solving the healthcare problem would help federal government support science research, would help state governments uh, support access to education in our wonderful state university system. I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions um, from on, on the, anything I talked about or you know, anything you'd like to hear about the current condition of the research university. Thanks. Thanks. Gerhard. Hey, I have a question. Uh, right yeah. for the mic, please. Oh. Please. OK. Uh, I think when, when I was president, and now even more so, uh, in, uh, in, in the last decade or so, universities began to support ever more research with their own resources. Exactly. And uh, you did not talk about that, but I was wondering whether you could kind of give us your perspective, how that looks to you, what the problems of that, what the extent of it, the problems, <coughs> and where this is headed. Mm -hmm. So um, you're right. So if you go back uh, 30 years, uh, the, um, uh, the use of own university funds to support basic research su supported about 1% of all basic research uh, done in the economy. Now it supports 11%. And exactly the same numbers for private philanthropy. So in other words, um, obviously the university money is largely philanthropy, but Hughes Institute and other, and other um, philanthropic organizations that directly support research. Uh, going from 1 to 11% over, maybe it's 40 years actually, I think, uh, where the data go back. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's, 
I, I guess I don't feel I don't feel this is necessarily a distressing fact. If, if you can generate private philanthropic support for scientific research, I think that's great. I mean, you know, we all, we all believe in, you know, the widest possible menu of good things should be available to our donors because people give more money when they can support something they're passionate about. And if we have donors who want to cure cancer and want to support cancer research, and we do, have plenty, um, uh, I'm sure you do too, uh, I, I think it, it probably makes the pie larger. So I don't, I don't see it as a really serious problem. Now, it, it, you know, the strains, uh, that, you know, d differentially, it depends on the institution. I mean, you at Stanford have done a great job raising money for science facilities. At some of the stodgier Ivy League institutions, like Yale and Harvard, it's really tough to raise money for science buildings. I mean, pe people want, First of all, a far smaller percentage of our graduates at Yale and at Harvard were science or engineering majors. And they're, you know, we're, we're overweight to finance and you're overweight to technology. That helps a lot, make it easier, a little bit easier for Stanford to, to pay those, those big costs. So in that respect, the, 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 um, that indirect cost of research is, uh, uh, is, is somewhat of a stress for many institutions. I was often yeah. wondering whether we have the breadth Mr. Atchemendi ought to know the answer to that one. I, I, think, I think it does, it tend up, tend, ends up being that, 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 I mean, sometimes the donors just come along and want to do a particular thing, and you don't have a lot of control over that. But sometimes, you know, the donors will, will be steered toward a particular priority, and sometimes we'll go out and seek funding for particular scientific um, uh, avenues. And, you know, the provost, and to the extent the provost wants to let the president in on it, have, uh, have a lot to do about picking those priorities. Now, you know, different universities have different processes of how are the faculty engaged in, in developing the menu. I think we all try to make that happen and engage faculty leadership in, in those decisions. Um, but it's tough because, the, the, you know, so often departments have very different ideas. I mean, if, if our astronomy departments could have their way, we'd be spending so much money on new telescopes. That, I mean, you can't imagine. I mean, Caltech is really lucky to have Gordon Moore who will spend a half a billion dollars on the next generation telescope, but we don't have any donors like that. And, and I don't know what your story is, but you know, we have, we've had to use fungible money to participate in, the, in, the, uh, you know, in some of the big telescope projects. Yeah, John, you, don't, yeah, you want to follow up? Maybe Vannevar Bush's fourth principle, or maybe this is a footnote to the other, was that, that the federal government should fully fund the cost of research at universities, and that has been eroding as well. Yes. Do you have any brilliant insights about how we can turn that around? <laughs> no, what, 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 what uh, John's referring to is, the, is sort of indirect costs. In, it is mentioned in the Bush report uh, that, that the cost, cost should be fully supported, in, including the costs of facilities, you know, amortized through recoveries on our grants. Um, and the government is, is, has been tough. I mean, the pressures on budgets have led, led the government to make rules that, that, that constrain certain kinds of expenditures. We have a limit on the administrative uh, support of an actual cap that's well below our, our true cost. Um, it creates a bias toward debt funding of, in, of, of uh, facilities because, um, because the debt interest on, and amortization on debt can be uh, recovered, whereas donor finance buildings can't be. Um, so, I, you know, many of us have tried, weighed in, we've all been involved in trying to convince the federal government not to make continued adverse uh, rules. Right. How much of that's indirect, unrecovered indirect costs? No, I think it includes it. I think, the, I think in other words, I'm pretty sure it does. So, the, so that's a good question. And I, I, probably there aren't good data to actually do the calculation, but I, a couple of case studies could, that would be an interesting case study to do on Yale and Stanford. How much of, the, of, of what, we're, what we're reporting as spending on research of our own is actually 
unrecovered as opposed to new projects and unfunded projects. Yeah, good point. Yeah, either yes. one, one and two. Yes, Rick, thanks. Uh, your last comment was that to relieve some of the financial pressure on governments that would allow them to invest more in basic research requires solving the health care problem. And I wonder if you have some thoughts on how we might go about that <laughs> and, the that, and the role that universities might play. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 obviously, it, it's, a, it's a very tough problem. It's a very tough system. But, um, well, I'll, I'll say it because, you know, people said, said never say this. But a, a tremendous gain would come if this country were ready for a serious conversation about end-of-life care. Um, I mean, it seems to me, end-of-life care, it seems to me that, that if, we could, uh, if we could refrain from the use of every technological possibility to prolong lives for a week or a month or six months of people in, whose quality of life is terrible, um, we could save a lot of money. I mean, that's, what are they, the numbers, you see numbers all over the map, but one of them is a, is that a quarter or a third of Medicare, of Medicare costs, uh, uh, which is maybe 30% of all healthcare costs, so maybe 10% of all healthcare costs are devoted to end of life care. And, uh, and that, um, you know, bringing that number down would help a lot. Obviously the re reorganization and a greater efficiency in the system is helping actually. I mean, there, the, you know, the, and here, academic research has played an important role. I mean, really highlighted the tremendous the Dartmouth project and other investigators have really highlighted the differential cost looking from local community to local community and by type of organization um, of, of physician practices and relations with hospitals. And so there are big system improvements. And because it's essentially a local product, healthcare services, there isn't the kind of competition across jurisdictions that, that, you, that would force you to a solution where the most efficient systems would, would arise. But if we can find a way, I mean, the government obviously has the reimbursement tool as a way to try to push that. And I'd say that's the other thing, you know, just get systemic reform to deliver healthcare services efficiently. Yes. Rick, given it's, it's quite unlikely that we're going to have a, a change in our financial situation with uh, debt service and entitlements and health care in the near future, although I would certainly advocate spending more money on basic research than entitlements. I don't think there are a lot of people that would go along with the current administration on that. Um, have you thought about or have there been any really good studies about how we can spend our money more wisely other than giving more money to Stanford and Yale? Um, so in all seriousness, have, we, have there been any in-depth analysis of, of how we could actually do it better, take the money we're spending and, 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 and have better results? Um, you mean in research? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, let me, but let me, before I do that, let me make one comment about entitlements. I mean, you've got right here at Stanford two people, in John Chauvin and Mike Boskin, who have known for a long, long time how to cut the burden of Social Security. I mean, there's lots of ways to do it. It's, it, it's, it's truthfully an easy fix if it weren't so politically volatile. I mean, you know, changing the index, changing the, you know, the, the pushing back the retirement date. There's a whole lot of ways. Get my uh, vote on that. Yeah, what? yeah, but there's a whole lot of ways to do that. And, um, and, that, that, and that, that's not as big a factor as healthcare costs, but it's not insignificant, and particularly as we go forward. Um, you know, how could we, I, 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 may, I gave a couple of suggestions for allocating resources that would, I think, produce somewhat better results. One, what, one is to up the ante on the basic fundamental research and create the kind of incentives for private firms to do the applied and development research. And we have an RD tax credit. You could, you, could, you, you, you could examine how that works, how it might be made most, even more effective. Um, uh, th th there, there, there could be, um, uh, there could, we could use other mechanisms to generate, I, I mean, I mentioned the procurement process, which I think would, you know, if you, if you have a big contract from the government to supply electric cars, you'll do the R&D to get there. And, and so it, it, you don't need the R, federally funded R&D to do it. So, I mean, why the government doesn't sort of raise the bar on all its vehicle procurements 
is a mystery to me. I mean, we ought to, we, we ought to go way beyond the, 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 the standard uh, corporate average fuel economy limits and, 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 and induce innovation in the, in the transportation sector. Um, same thing with government purchases of power. We, we, could, we could do, I, 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 this solves the energy problem, but it also helps with the R&D with the R&D funding problem because a, you know, a good lucrative market for important services that has so good social objectives will help drive, will help to induce some innovation as well. Yes. Oh, uh, one uh, component of the uh, issue that you touched on briefly earlier uh, was K through 12 education. I was wondering if you could uh, speak briefly as to what do you think the relationship is going to be in between uh, K through 12 education policies and reforms and such, and America's uh, continuing uh, scientific competitiveness. So, you know, K through 12 education, of course, is a chronic problem. There's, there's, um, we have very severe weaknesses in our education, particularly in inner cities. Um, um, the, uh, the. Um, there's a tremendous amount of innovation and experimentation that's gone on in the last 15 to 20 years in, in K through 12 education. So the interesting thing is that we actually know the right models for, for making it better. Um, some of the charter schools um, have done a terrific job in getting really tr you know, quantum improvements in the results of the poorest performing uh, um, K through 12 students in our society. Um, again, it's the institutional barriers. It's really public education about what works and what doesn't. And it's, you know, you have these two huge forces of inertia when you try to do K through 12 reform, and they're equally bad. Uh, one, of course, is the teachers' unions, and the other is the school bureaucracies, which is essentially, in most cities, a patronage system, that, that, you know, pol political patronage system. Uh, that, that where, the, where the employment is not dependent on performance. We have a great experiment going on in New Haven right now, uh, which was occasioned by a window, just a moment in time, it, where the American Federation of Teachers was willing to write a very different kind of contract. And this came about, it's a great story. Um, Obama and Artie Duncan came in. They wanted to improve school performance. Randy Weingarten at the AFT was busy fighting uh, Joel Klein in New York and Michelle Rhee in Washington to make sure that nothing good happened in those cities. And, 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 um, and so she's under tremendous pressure, Randy Weingarten, from Duncan and Obama. You know, you're, you're really spoiling the party here where we want to make serious investments in education. You've got to allow performance-based funding and, improve, and, 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 and promotion on the merits and, in, in the schools and, in, and of the faculty and of, and of the principals and evaluation and personnel review. So she wrote a contract with New Haven that does all these things. It's phenomenal. And it's given us a chance to sort of uh, essentially weed out poor performing teachers, um, to reconstitute the poorest performing schools and, try and reorganize them. Uh, and you know, it's only a couple of years of practice so far, but it's a great, it's a great model. Now, hopefully, um, you, again, it's the same problem I, we, we just mentioned. Um, uh, with healthcare, K through 12 education is, a lo is you know under local control, and that means that the diffusion of innovations is very very hard. You know, there's no there's no competitive pressure for New Haven schools to improve just because Bridgeport students improve or for you know you, you get the point. And and um, and so again, tying funding at the state level or at the federal level to performance improvement would be an important tool. We uh, have a tradition which I have had few complaints about of stopping sharply at six. And I think we need to maintain that. So thank you. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you all.